It's the magic of the musicals on Broadway and you join me here at the St. James Theatre for a production which I have to say I don't really like. Gary Beach, how are you? I'm just great, thanks. Gary, I don't like it. I love this show and I've seen it about 15 times and every time I come to New York or LA, if I'm lucky enough to get there, I go and see this show because it is, without question in my opinion, the funniest show Ever. You know, when right after we opened here in New York, uh, some one of the local critics, his his quote was the best show ever. And I think that it's that that's so over the top, like the show itself. But I have to agree with you. Just before doing this, I did uh, out in California, a production of a funny thing happened on the way to the forum, which I think before us was certainly the funniest show ever. But I, I don't disagree with you. I hear laughs every night. I think that's one reason I've been with the show so long. It never gets tired for me. The, the laughs come at you ferociously every night. I love it. Mel Brooks is a genius, isn't he? He is a genius. And that was part of the joy of putting the show together originally back in 2001. That Mel was there very hands-on. Of course, we had the great Susan Stroman who kept him in line and the rest of us because we're all bad boys. We call ourselves laugh whores because uh, <laughs> we'll do anything for the laugh. You know, at the time we had Nathan, Elaine, Matthew Broderick, Roger Bart, Katie Huffman, and uh, Brad Oscar. And these are all people who know what they're doing. So we did have have uh, Susan Stroman as our ringmaster to, to like crack the whip and keep us in line and that's too far believe it or not we could go too far and uh, so and still today we have uh, a different cast I just came back from Los Angeles uh, opening the show out there with Jason Alexander the great Martin Short and um, it transfers from coast to coast they love it out there too what I love about the show is the energy in it. There really is an incredible amount of effort goes into every single performance to make this thing happen. Some shows just kind of glide along and it's wonderful to watch and they're fantastic in their own right. But this really does take effort from the two lead characters. I think uh, it was said at the time, and I don't think it's been disproved, that everyone working on this show, when we were in rehearsal and in the planning stages, was working at the top of their form, from Mel to Susan, uh, of course, uh, our lighting designer, our great costume designer, William Ivy Long. He sort of topped himself with this show and then went on, of course, to do Hairspray, where I think he topped himself again. But uh, every one of us were uh, allowed to work at our peak, and I think it still shows on stage. What I said to the people at Hairspray was that I think that's the most fun, but this is the funniest in a sense that if you don't get one gag, you'll get the next one. And it's a bit like a bus, really. If you miss that one, then there's another one coming along and you can miss that one and you'll still be laughing 10 seconds later because it really is so brilliantly written. You don't feel stupid if you don't get the joke. You can just titter all the way through. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing about this show is basically about one thing, people wanting to put on a Broadway musical, which they, of course, consider to be the ultimate in art. And uh, you have Max Bialystok, who is the, the, he fancies himself a great entrepreneur, impresario, producer of Broadway. Of course, he's schlock, but that doesn't keep him from wanting to be a great producer. Then you have Leo Bloom, who is an accountant, and all he wants to do is be a producer. Then you've got Roger Debris, who considers himself a great director. He's terrible, too. But all of these people, they just want to put on a show. And you've got, of course, all the little old ladies from Little Old Lady Land, who uh, Max Bialystok hits on for money to put on his shows. That's all this show is about, putting on a show. And I think I think that that appeals to a lot of an audience a lot of audiences and the thing i love about it as well it's a parody of a parody parodying an ironic parody really isn't it we're, we're seeing a show about a show and then a show within a show that's right that's right i think if you recall in the movie, the fans of the movie, they all wonder, how are they going to deal with springtime for Hitler? Well, our audience in the theater, in our case at the St. James, becomes the audience of springtime for Hitler. And some nights they are totally outraged by it. Others, they find it just hysterically funny. In fact, often, because I'm in the number, I, I see two people sitting next to each other having totally different reactions to this number. One night, we had been open. We hadn't opened yet. We were in previews here in New York. I believe it was the first week. I was in the middle of springtime for Hitler, and I do play Adolf Elizabeth Hitler in the show itself. And uh, I'm skipping across the stage, and I see someone in the front row stand up. <laughs> he was yelling at the stage, goes storming out into the lobby. Now, the audience is laughing hysterically. They actually think it's part of the show. <laughs> he gets to the, gets to the lobby. Well, who's sitting in the back? Mel Brooks. And he, Mel goes out to the lobby, and this old guy and Mel, you've got two old Jews out in the lobby yelling and screaming at each other. He says, you should be ashamed of yourself. 
myself. And Mel said, I fought in World War II. You know, this is what we have going. Well, the, you know, this show can have different reactions to different people. But the only, the only enemy of this show is a dumb audience. If you come here with no idea of what we're doing or, or uh, New York or World War II or Nietzsche or any of those things, you may not have a good time. But if you come in with a full platter, you're going to love it. One of the most difficult jobs I've ever had or we've ever had here in this theater was uh, two days after 9-11. Uh, of course, all of Broadway, New York, America practically shut down for two days. Um, Mayor Giuliani actually called our producer, Rocco Landisman, and said, can the producers be on tonight? Uh, at 9.13, September 13th. And Rocco said, absolutely. So all of Broadway lit up that night. And uh, I came to work and I was walking from the subway over on 47th Street. across. If, if you know uh, New York, it's Times Square, basically. I'm walking across a Times Square at uh, close to half hour on September 13th. Normally, it's pretty bustling. There was no one. I see no one. I cross across 44th Street. I look down the street. I see no one. Schubert Alley, a few people. I turn the corner onto 44th Street where we are. And there were hundreds of people in front of the St. James. And they wanted to laugh. To do Hitler that night, it reverberated so much. Because all of a sudden, the laughs became ferocious. Totally ferocious in the middle of that number. Because, you know... I think people maybe <clears throat> said to themselves, if we can laugh at this, like this, 50 years after this, this guy Bin Laden will be gone too. And when I left the theater that night, some lady grabbed me. She says, do you think you'll be doing a musical about Bin Laden next? I said, I hope so. I'll never forget the night. I'll never forget it. Let's talk about you as a performer. Gary Beach, you've done so much. How did you get here? Because Broadway is so amazing. We were talking before the interview about the quality of performers. How did you make your way here? It's a place I always wanted to be. I grew up in Virginia, Alexandria, Virginia, which is a town right outside of Washington, D.C. I, I started going to the theater at a young age, but I don't come from that as a background. My family are people that never went to the theater, but for some reason I was attracted to it. And through a series of uh, lucky incidents or whatever, I, uh, I ended up, going to Broadway. It's like I auditioned. I mean, you know, I, I studied. Of course, I studied. I always, when I speak to schools and to kids, I always say the worst thing is a dumb actor. If you come at this with, uh, without a lack of, with, with a lack of knowledge of anything from what someone wears to what they eat, architecture, whatever, you have to come at it with everything. The Producers is a perfect example of that. Sometimes I think we walk out and we're in the middle of springtime for Hitler. There's the uh, challenge tap where, of course, uh, Joseph Stalin and Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt challenge Adolf Hitler to a tap contest. Well, some nights, I swear to you, I think we, some of the audience is looking at the stage and saying, who's the guy in the wheelchair? You know, really, of course, President Roosevelt. But uh, other nights, as soon as the wheelchair comes rolling out, they think, oh, my God. This man is challenging to a tap number. It's, it's just, it's deeply funny. I heard a line on the TV this morning as I, as I woke up, which I thought was wonderful, that a guy said, you know you're getting old when you take a girlfriend out to the movies and you say you're going to see a film about JFK. And she says, why are they making a film about an airport? Oh, dear. Yes. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> they introduce you to Brad Musgrove, who plays Carmen Ghia. Hi. How are you? Good. Great. Glad to be here. You have a really fun part, don't you? It's it's being paid to go to a party. Camp, outrageous, ridiculous. What, what can I call this character? Uh, yeah, all of the above. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, everything that is you've wanted to do in your s secret <laughs> life. <laughs> uh, you you know the the life that you have in your head. You get to do on stage. There's there are no rules. There are you know over the top is not enough. I love the, the arms and the legs and the movements and the way that you enter and go off stage. It's just so brilliantly done. How long did it take you to rehearse this part so it was perfect? Uh, it, it's always a work in progress. I understudied the role from, from the beginning of the show. So I had um, about a year, a little longer, to watch Roger Bart and emulate um, what he did and put my own style on it. I have a dance background. I you know, had a, 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 my primary career as a, as a dancer. And so I bring a physicality to the role. 
Brad is, uh, do you remember the show Fosse? He was an original cast member. As a matter of fact, Brad was the logo of the show, the guy at the hat. That was Brad was Musgrove. Five stories tall in the West End. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was the picture of me out in front. Of, I forget what theater it was, but uh, Gwen Verdon had given me a photo of opening night with all the crowds below the marquee and everything in my picture five stories tall it was really quite thrilling so he he does bring a physicality to it that uh none of the other carmen gears have been able to do and uh it's in fact so much so that william ivy long redesigned the costume for brad musgrove because he he does have you'll see he, he's wonderful he's funny and we love working together it's a gas it's, it's I, there's no one better to be on stage with than mr gary beach Whoa, how sweet but you know it's just so nice it isn't is. it? but i have to tell you you know for all those that have not seen the show they'll find out that the real love interest of this show is carmen and roger debris it really is they 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 totally depend on each other and love each other and they're just two outrageous queens that live uptown <laughs> <laughs> that's what they are can you over count your role do you think you can only go over the top if there's no heart if there if there is no love between uh, for, speaking for our roles between Carmen and Roger if there's no love and no um, dependency and no um, honest you know coming from the heart support then if you were two individuals if you were two comedians out there just yucking it up and sticking it up for your own self as opposed to uh helping support the other the other yes that that can that can go too far yeah. uh, you know as far if if you're you know too campy as long as the other person is is a compliment to that and there's a love there there is a there's a mutual respect and a love there then you really have there's you can't really go too wrong i'm going to ask you one final question each and it's why you why do you think you got the role because this is such a competitive business there are hundreds of thousands of people who think they're stars who want to be stars you've only got to watch pop idol to realize that yeah. and you're sat here now in an amazing theater in probably the best production ever possibly i mean certainly in terms of winning awards so why you my initial response is to say i'm lucky but for me my definition of luck is preparation meeting opportunity um the opportunity was there and i was prepared i you know i originally came into the show with the original company as um a dance captain i was known on Broadway as a dance captain. They needed a dance captain for the show. They hired me. I was a swing. I was versatile enough to do many different parts, and I understudied the role from the beginning. Um, as far as being lucky enough to, to be given the opportunity to have the role of Carmen for myself, I, I really like the character, and I... When I went on as an understudy, there was, I knew that there was something I could bring to it, to um, something different. I could, I could enhance, uh, not enhance, uh, uh, I could honor what was, what was given to me, you know, by Roger Bart, who was absolutely f so brilliant in the part. And um, basically, uh, it's a fancy way to say if I could steal what he did you know every good performance you steal something from someone you admire and i definitely admire him and his take on the part you know there was something else i could bring to it to make it my own and um i was lucky enough that the director and the producers recognized that as well and gave me the part i am the luckiest person in show business you know i'm sure if you interviewed everyone in the show they'd all say that but you would all say that brad is the luckiest fellow in show business. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it really is because I know my career as, as a dancer and that's all I ever really wanted. I just, you know, wanted to dance and I was lucky enough to do, uh, you know, great dance pieces and, and to do Fosse, which was a brilliant choreographer's work. That to be given the opportunity to actually um, say words and sing songs. And I really, I don't did dance a step in this show. It was, it's a nice departure. And, but I... I grabbed onto it with both hands, knowing that this kind of opportunity rarely, rarely happens for a, a chorus dancer. And um, I am just thrilled to be here. Brad, do you think you'll ever go back to just being able to dance now? Or do you think you'll always want to do a bit of the comedy and a bit of the acting? Is it too much fun to give it up now? You know, as, as a dancer, you are an actor. 
uh, you just do it without saying words. You use your body, you use your face, you use your um, expressions to create a mood uh, to suit the piece. And um, so there will always be acting involved. As far as straight talking, <laughs> um, you know what? I have to say, I, I'm, I go where the work is. And um, if there's if there's a, a dance piece that excites me as a dancer, as it excites the creative part of me, then yes, I will be more than happy to return to that. I don't feel that this is I'm breaking out of anything because it was the dance world was very good to me, and I was thrilled to be there. And I don't consider it something to break out of. You know, I will always be happy to return. You certainly don't do much straight talking in this role, do you? Uh, no. Well, <laughs> straight, no. <laughs> Finally to you, I mean, this is the greatest role, isn't it, really? I mean, is there any other role you could do now that, that you would enjoy as much, do you think? That, that is a great question, and I really don't know. I can say that I'm still, well, you know, having the time of my life doing this. I, um, I... And I also have to say, for those who are interested, it was the easiest job I ever got. <laughs> uh, I got a call one day. I was living in Los Angeles, and, and the great Vinnie Liff, who since left us, he's passed away about a year or so ago, a great casting director here in New York, and uh, basically called me and said, uh, Gary, we're doing a reading of the producers. Nathan is going to be doing uh, Max, and um, there's this part that you have to get in on very early. It's, it's, it's everything you do. And uh, then when I found out that the departure was that this guy also plays Hitler, which is different from the film, I thought, oh, my God. I flew to New York. We did the reading a couple of times on a Sunday. They raised all the money that afternoon to do the show. And uh, the next day I got a phone call and it was Vinny. And he said, Gary, they're not even going to audition anybody. It's yours. And that's how I got this show. Incredible. That, that has brought me just so much happiness. Really, I love it. The thing that I find ironic about this show is it, if it had have died on its backside, it would have been the biggest embarrassment ever because that's what it's about, isn't it? It's about shows not succeeding. Thank God they did it well. Well, yeah, absolutely. And, and the show has been blessed from the beginning. But you're right. Everybody said, didn't you know? Didn't you know? And, of course, the no. answer is no. no. You know, we, I think the first time we had an inkling was when uh, we were in rehearsal and they do a press junket sort of thing where they invite fellows like yourself in uh, or the local newspapers reporters, columnists to see a presentation. We did the opening number, which had been staged, and this is no costumes or anything in a rehearsal hall. The opening number, uh, Matthew and the girls did I Want to Be a Producer, and then we did the finale of Act One. Well, at the end of that, the press stood up and cheered. Well, that's not done. They're supposed Never. to leave there and say, oh, these people are in trouble. You know, that's what's supposed to happen. So I think that was the first inkling I had that, oh, then you get worried. You think, oh, well, they're expecting too much now. So uh, then when we got to Chicago, it started happening. And by the time we got back here to New York, went into rehearsal again before previews, there were lines down the street. And, of course, after we opened and the Tonys and all of that, you know what happened. It was madness. It's an incredible show and an incredible success. And um, when I say this is the funniest show ever, I mean it. It genuinely is. I come and talk to you guys every time I come to New York. And I talked to Brad last year, and I could talk to you for hours because there's so much to talk about this show. Mel Brooks is a genius. I think it's official, isn't it? He is. I've got to tell you this before we leave. Go on. Uh, if you've seen the show, you'll appreciate this. Uh, we were in rehearsal, and the uh, end of the Keep It Gay scene, they convinced Roger uh, Debris myself to sign the contract and it was written Roger Debris and that was the end and we rehearsed like that for like weeks and Mel was sitting in front of me this day and Nathan holds out sign the paper and I take the pen and I go Roger Debris and Mel yells out Roger Elizabeth Debris <laughs> and of course we all looked at each other was like of course of course. <laughs> of course. And so it just puts a button on the scene. It's perfect. And he just thought of it like that. 